tomorrow <clears throat> so that I can show you the working. But for tonight, I, I, I just want to explain so many concepts to you. All right, so uh, once again, this is the artificial intelligence course and how we're making the presentation. And the goal of this course is to make you to understand the general concept of artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, data science project life cycle, and some other very important concepts when it comes to training machine learning algorithms. Okay, so this course will allow you to connect the dots um, and make you sound in all these concepts and be able to explain it and be able to understand what you are doing in your data science projects. So let's get started. So what is AI and ML? So AI is just an abbreviation for artificial intelligence. The ML is an abbreviation for machine learning. So when you hear AI, that is artificial intelligence. And when you hear ML, that is machine learning. Now I will still go ahead and tell you more about what is artificial intelligence and what is machine learning and how it these two terms you know how these two terms also lead to other things we do in data science okay so let's see what ai is in detail so artificial intelligence is a catch-up term used to describe intelligent machines mark that word intelligent machines which can solve problems, make or suggest decisions, and perform tasks that traditionally required humans to do. Now, when you hear AI, AI is not just a single thing, but it's a constellation of different technologies. You know, it's a catch-all, a catch-all term. So it comprises of different technologies that we use in the modern world and those technologies produces the data that we analyze in data science so ai is like the umbrella name is like the catcher nets or term that encapsulates all these technologies now that leads us to what machine learning is so machine learning is a subfield of artificial intelligence. So mark that word is a subfield. That means machine learning is under artificial intelligence. You know, we said artificial intelligence is a constellation of different technologies. Machine learning is part of them. So humans combine data with algorithms to train a model using that data. So that is what we do when we say we are doing machine learning. We combine data with computer algorithms to train a model using that data. Then the trained model can then make predictions on new data without being explicitly programmed to do so. I'll still explain more about this explicitly programmed. So you can see this is artificial intelligence. Then it leads to uh, machine learning, you know. So here, machine learning leads to deep learning. So deep learning, or what we call neural nets, is a subfield of machine learning, while machine learning uh, itself is a subfield of artificial intelligence. But let's go ahead and see more. So now, in the last slide, you know, I told you that whenever we are doing machine learning, 
we are simply combining data with computer algorithms in order to train a model. So now that brings us to the next question. What are these algorithms? You know, what are ML algorithms? So algorithms are just computer programs that adjust themselves to perform better as they are exposed to more data. So they strive on data, they learn from data. The learning part of a machine learning means that these programs can change how they process data over time. So in other words, a machine learning algorithm can adjust its own settings, giving feedback on its previous performance in making predictions about the tax. So these computer algorithms, um, they are a bunch of uh, mathematical concepts, you know, and they are computer programs, and they are designed to learn from data. So as part of their learning stage, they can adjust themselves to learn more from the data you are feeding in, you know, and they can also give you feedback on how well they've learned that data. And we can use them for classification tax or for determining a magnitude, which we call uh, regression, pro, uh, regression tax. So that is what uh, machine learning or computer algorithms mean. So I hope you are connecting the dots. So let's go ahead. <laughs> so that leads us to what is deep learning. You know, deep learning is a subfield of machine learning. In machine learning, we use computer algorithms. Why deep learning is another subfield of machine learning. Of course, in deep learning also, it's all about learning. So we also use computer algorithms too. But deep learning is a subfield of machine learning. So what is deep learning? In deep learning, a neural net algorithm, so this time around, a neural net algorithm is used. It's giving a massive volumes of data and the tasks to perform, such as classification. The resulting model is capable, after being trained, of solving complex tasks, such as recognizing image or translating speech in real time, you know, like text to speech or speech to text. Now, if you see, uh, look at your right or yeah, right hand side, yeah, you will see this image. So this is the image of a deep neural net adjusting the strength of its connection in order to better convey uh, or understand the input now the input here is a dog the picture of a dog and this picture of a dog will be fed into the neural nets so all this architecture is is called um all this uh architecture they are called neural nets and their purpose is to process these inputs which is this dog image so when the dog image goes through all these architectures, the, the, <clears throat> the image can be broken down into pixels, like this layer one now, this first layer. Uh, in the first layer, we have neurons. So all these circles, they are called the neurons. So this layer one, we capture the pixel values in the image of the dog. This layer two, we identify the edges or um, we identified the edges for the pictures or in the pictures. Then these are uh, layered three uh, we do a combination of those identified edges. Then this layer four, we identify the features. 
Then finally, the last layer, which is layer five, we combine the features identified and it's going to give you an output. And that output will be to identify this image as a dog. So that's the power of a neural net. So this is like a net and it functions like the human brain. One layer fires up into the next layer. The next layer fires up into the third layer. Each of the layers are identifying different things in the image. And that's why at the end of the day, they could, uh, the neural net or the deep learning uh, model could easily identify this picture to be a dog. So that's why uh, I said that we use deep learning for complex tasks like recognizing objects within an image or even translating speech. And we have different use cases of deep learning nowadays. Some of them are on the phone that you are using. So uh, that's how it works. It's a deep learning because of this architecture. Uh, the normal machine learning or the traditional machine learning it doesn't have a kind of complicated uh, architecture like this during the learning stage. But for a deep learning, you can see the different layers which truly makes it uh, deep learning. Okay, so that's how it works. So we we'll go to the next slide. So what is deep learning? So the mystery of all our brains fit a signal. from our senses and transmit those signals to our conscious awareness drove much of the drove much of the early interest in deep neural networks among AIPS. So um, the deep learning architecture which I showed you the last time was designed based on human brain, how the human brain function. You know, the human brain has different, um, have different layers. Yeah, so uh, that's exactly the way the architecture of the deep learning looks like. So uh, AI, AI engineers or pioneers uh, believed that if they could have a mathematical model with different layers, then such a kind of uh, mathematical model or computer algorithm can easily do complex tasks too, just like the human brain. So that was what uh, gave rise to deep learning as a subfield of machine learning. In order to see if we could have something more deeper you know, the machine learning that could perform more complex tasks than the traditional machine learning uh, stuff. Uh, but uh, deep learning actually works with a lot of data and it's better you apply it to something that is very, very complex. Otherwise, the uh, the traditional machine learning we just suffice. There's no need to do deep deep learning if what you are working on doesn't require it. You are uh, it's still fine to stay with uh, the general machine learning uh, algorithms rather than going to do deep learning. 
So like deep learning is, is used for projects like speech translation and all those uh, tasks that could be very complex, you know. So that's what we use deep learning for. Complex tasks, complex, very complex da data, unstructured data, okay? But if your data is just in an Excel sheet and it's not that complex, it has a structure, uh, it's well defined, you are not processing an image and all those, uh, or you are not pro processing text or voice, then you don't really need to use deep learning. Uh, <clears throat> except your data, where your data could too could be in an Excel sheet, you know, uh, where arranged, but the data could be much and you could have done some analysis and you could have noticed that this data is actually carrying a high degree of uncertainty in different areas. Then you can try your hands on deep learning, whether deep learning can uh, work on such a kind of complex uh, data sets. Otherwise, uh, you can just use the normal machine learning algorithms. Okay, so um, uh, using deep learning also do not necessarily guarantee uh, good performance. Okay, so let's see how the three of them now relates together. So we have this circle, we have the artificial intelligence. Then next to it, we have the machine learning, which is the ability of computer to learn without being explicitly programmed. And lastly, we have the deep learning, which is a machine learning algorithms with a brain-like logical structure of algorithms called artificial neural networks. So that leads us to what is data science? Yeah. So data science is a new field of computer science. Broadly, it encompasses data systems and processes aimed at aimed at maintaining data sets and deriving meaning out of them. In the context of AI, it is the practice of people who are doing machine learning. So in the context of AI, you know, data science is a subfield under AI. So in the context of AI, whenever you are doing machine learning, you are said to be a data scientist. And your goal is to derive meaning or generate insights from data and use those insights to inform strategic decisions. So who is a data scientist then? He or she is responsible for extracting insights that help businesses and organizations make smart decisions. You know, I told you about making decisions. The data science is all about using data to make decisions. And of course, not just mere using data to make decisions, but data which have been trained with computer algorithms and those computer algorithms, they would actually be the one to generate those insights that would be used for these smart decisions. So a data scientist explore and analyze data using machine learning algorithms. It does this by creating models, which could be around customer experience, economics, energy, revenue, agriculture, climate, 
or whatever they are trying to predict. So it is not exhaustive. It is inexhaustive. So your task as a da da data scientist is to use data to uh, is to combine data or feed data into machine learning algorithms and allow that process to result into models that could be used in the area of uh, in areas you know such as optimizing customer experience, different uh, economic decisions, or any other thing, you know, yeah. Of course, there are several use cases. Okay, so before I go to the next uh, slide, uh, do we have any question so far? Anyone with any question so far? Uh, so this presentation is also meant to be a discussion class. Because this presentation is very, very important so that you can understand in a sound way all these concepts and be, be able to like position yourself as a data scientist who knows, you know, about the feed he or she is and the different terminologies and concepts and guidelines in that field. Okay, Hona Matthew, let me have you. Hello, good evening, everyone. Hi, Mr. Amy. Yeah. Um, Please, you said something earlier when you were talking about deep learning. You said um, uh, the fact that um, I think you were cautioning um, us to that you may not necessarily, there are some tasks that you want to do that you don't necessarily need deep learning and um, that you can just use machine learning. And then you now made a statement saying that the fact that you use um, deep learning does not mean that it may, um, it may actually um, I think you said something about achieving what you wanted to achieve. That does not guarantee that yes, it will be good. Yeah. Yes. So uh, that's that's kind of giving me a concern because um, if the if the probability and risk that um, humans face and henceforth we are looking at machines to get a level of accuracy, if we still can achieve that level of accuracy, then what what's the difference? And the second question is, like, what are the kind of scenarios where machine learning when, um, would not do well, kind of? Yeah. Um, yeah, let me start from your uh, second question. Uh, what scenario or can we say machine learning May, uh, or w what condition we machine learning not do it or something like that yeah so um in doing a project you know sometimes you need to ask yourself is does this project require machine learning or not because there's some projects that just simple uh heuristic or decision rule can actually surface and there's no need to actually be collecting data trying to build machine learning models so for example um there are some well-defined rules okay all around us so uh like for example um from the project you did in your application programming that could be seen as a rule based project it's not a machine learning project okay it's just using python to write some if else statements or this define some python functions to do some things so those are like rule based you know like if you enter this figure then it calculate the price for you then you click uh, 
uh, you, you you click some submit then it gives you the total price so you don't really need machine learning to do such things for such things are already well defined so when we talk about machine learning we mean you have a data set and the data sets you don't even understand what is going on there and you want to use computer algorithms to assist you to uncover the patterns in the data or to make sense or to generate insight from the data so that is when we use machine learning then um deep learning does not guarantee good results all the time yes it is because every learning is actually a trial and error or trial and error or an iterative steps you know so when it is a is an is an iterate it, 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 it every learning you know is a kind of uh, steps you know and those steps are like they have their confidence uh, intervals you know or they have they are based on probability or guesses okay so for that reason using the deep learning deep, deep learning also is trying its best to guess using those massive architecture so if it doesn't guess right or it also makes me mistakes you know so that that's why i said since every learning is based on guesses and probabilities so that means anything that is based on probability is not guaranteed okay so it may turn out to be good or it may turn out to be bad so it's all about learning and making guesses and seeing if you guessed right so i hope you understand yeah i did okay let me have you yeah good evening mr Amy. yeah yeah so i i'm trying to look at uh, the definition of a, a data scientist okay there's this very particular slide that uh, they explore and analyze data using machine learning algorithm to create models around customer experience so i because before if uh, my understanding of uh, maybe data analysis is just that you have a set of data you just want to analyze probably for a research purpose but i'm thinking of let's assume that you want to somebody wants to go into a business like maybe before you go into you want to look at maybe the pattern of cons consumption of a particular product that will inform when to buy what influences the price and the rest of them so if it's a business that has not generated its own data what i'm actually trying to clarify is must it be a data that is generated by that particular business or you can bring in a data set an existing data set from another source to to do maybe a predictive sort of learning yeah thank you for that uh wonderful question yeah uh it would be best if you can if they can generate their own data uh that will be used for the predictive uh, analysis or model building but if they don't have data where well, there are different ways you can generate data for the business in the long run they will still need to have their own data they will still need to build their own model with their own custom data. So uh, there's no way you can do ma uh, machine learning or data science projects without data. And the best is for you to actually do it with your own custom data. But if you don't have your own custom data, we have some 
yeah you are you can use data from external sources but you will need to make sure that those data aligns with that business and captures the their unique metrics or what is unique to that business so you don't want to bring in a data set even though it's a data set in a retail sector but that data set was generated probably based on another retail store which may have different uh, characteristics compared to your own clients so or you can use it okay you can use it in in, in data science we have an area in deep learning called transfer learning in transfer learning we use pre-trained models so there are models that have been trained on massive data sets like for example recognizing images so you don't need to go around gathering your own image your own images you know if you want to do a project for a business that has to do with recognizing an object or an image you can just adopt those pre-trained models and use them because those pre-trained models have been trained on millions or billions of images and there's virtually they are virtually every knowledge of any you know a, 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 as much images you know as possible so that could be transferred and used for a business trying to build an object recognition software you know so that helps them out they don't need to go around gathering their own image data you know they can just adopt that pre-trained models to do the recognition of of objects for them so that works well in that kind of use case but in building predictive model to predict revenue for example it's better for you to use the data that belongs to the business because such things are not easily generalizable every business have their own unique revenue that may not be the same as the next business so it's better in that kind of use case it's better for the business to see how they can generate their own data and use their own data to build their own models but in the case of uh, the image recognition projects you know image is a chair here in london is a chair in nigeria <laughs> you know so the style can be different but chair is teacher you know so that that is it so some 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 projects are transferable why some projects are not easily transferable so you cannot easily bring data from 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 outside you know for some projects I, I hope you get me yes i i do i do thank you okay so any other question before we move on okay let's move on So that brings us to what is training when we say training in ml training is the process of teaching computer algorithms to perform a task you know in machine learning we use computer algorithms as our tool and we train them to perform a task like for example recognizing faces signals understanding text predicting an amount, classifying an, an incidence, and the list goes on and on. 
So that's what we mean by training is an act of teaching computer algorithms to perform a task. So in doing this, women need to provide massive volumes of training data. The more the data, the better the model's performance. And afterward, we need to select the appropriate algorithm to find the op best optimized outcome. So in the process of the training, the computer algorithms uh, will be compared and we settle for the best which lends uh, the data well. So in order to supply that massive amount of data uh, to our computer algorithms, we need to understand some sources of data. So these are uh, some sources of data. This is not exhaustive. So uh, you can see data can be ge generated from almost every, every source known to us in the present world. Is it from IoT devices? Is it from wearable de uh, devices like smartwatch? Is it from mobile phones? Is it from computer? Is it from business processes? from transport, from logistics, from electric vehicles, um, from the cyber world. You know, virtually every technology nowadays generates data in one form or the other. And all those data constitute what is called big data. So what happens when you train? When a data scientist runs an algorithm on a set of training data, the machine learning system generates rules and is embedded in a trained model. So how the learning is done is that when you pass your data through a machine learning algorithms, through a machine learning algorithm, the algorithm actually generates rules after seeing that data and embed those rules as trained model. The system learns from examples, that is the training data, rather than being traditionally programmed. So in this case, we don't have a programmer behind the computer telling the computer algorithm what to do. The computer algorithm by itself learns from the data and generates rules or generates insights or generates patterns or identify patterns or memo or memorizes patterns in the data you know and by doing that it becomes a trained model automatically the machine learning algorithm after doing all these things becomes or metamorphosed metamorphosed into a trained model yeah so by that time, we will say we have a trained model. Now let's see the difference between traditional programming and ML. So in traditional programming, we have this input here. Then we have the program. So all you need to do is to write some codes, then you have your inputs, then it passes then into the computer, then anybody using that system just generates an output. This uh, was what you did in your first projects. It's more like traditional programming. 
you know, where you write some Python functions, some conditional statements, then you define some input there, then the user will use it and generate the outputs. So that was what you did in your first project is our traditional programming that we all know. But when it comes to machine learning, that is a different ball game. So here we have the output, uh, rather, then we have the inputs. So you will feed in data sets that contains the output and the inputs into a machine learning algorithm. The machine learning algorithm learns the inputs and the outputs and develops a learning program. So that learning program can now be used or that trained model. So you can also see this learning program as trained model. So the trained model can now be used to take in new inputs and generate new outputs. So you can see the flow when it comes to machine learning, which is quite different from the traditional programming. So that was what I said in the last slide that I said in machine learning, we do not need to explicitly program the computer. We just feed in our inputs and outputs and allow the machine learning algorithm to learn them and develop a model based on what it has learned from them, from the inputs and the outputs that we initially fed in. So based on that knowledge, it can now be used to generate new outputs for new inputs. So that's the whole concept of machine learning. So now what happens when you train? For example, an input of test data of whether the rain will fall or not is fed and for example, an input of test data of whether the rain will fall or not into a trained model here. Yeah will result into a guess. The model then takes its guess and compares it to a grand truth about the data, effectively asking, did I get it right by saying it will rain? Let's say the model wants to say it will rain. So the difference between the model's guess and the grand truth, whether it rains or not, is its error. So the model measures that error and report it back to you. Or simply, it can relearn the test data all over again. In the case of deep learning networks, uh, we have what is called back propagation, whereby after the model learns the data, it can go back again and relearn it, trying, trying, trying to perfect uh, itself and trying to get the predictions right. So that's the whole concept here. When you feed in your test data, you know, we have the training data which we've used to train the model. Now the point of prediction, you are going to feed in your test data or at the point of evaluation, you are going to feed in your test data and immediately you feed in your test data into that trained model the trained model will start a process of uh, guessing, you know. And when I say guess, I don't just mean a random guess. I don't mean a careless guess. You know, this is a calculated guess. This is an intelligent guess. So when, when I say guess, or when you say guess, I don't mean a careless guess. You know, this model has, has been trained, so it's not going to do a careless guess. So it's not a careless guess. So once it takes its own guess, then it compares it with the grand truth, whether it actually rain or not. So the difference between its guess and the grand truth 
will tell us if the model has made a mistake or it has gotten it perfectly right. So as a recap, the algorithms combined with the training data. Remember, the algorithms are trained with training data, not external UMAM computer programmers. Create the AI rules that the model uses. So the AI rules the model uses was actually uh, created by the model itself after learning the training data. So the, it wasn't an UMA expert that was defining some Python functions for it. So that makes it to be different, you know. Yeah, so that is machine learning. You can see the picture by your right. So let's say we have this outlook. We want to predict if we should go out and play golf or not. And we are using this as a machine learning project. So once you feed in the data, then it gets its stats. And you can see if it's sunny and the immunity is greater, less than or greater than 75, you can go out to play golf. That means uh, the weather will be good. But if the humidity if it is sunny, but the humidity is greater than 75, then don't play. That will be the outcome or the prediction that will come from the trained model. It's going to tell you not to go out to play. You know, that's its own predictions. Okay, but later on, if you not discover that we the weather turned out to be good later, that means the, the model made a mistake by telling you not to go out to play. Whereas the weather is good or later turned out to be good. Okay, but if it tells you not to go out to play and you also identified later on that, yes, the model actually gave you the best guess or the best decision because later on the weather turned really bad so you'll be like happy for that and you will trust the model more and more with making decisions for you so that is how machine learning works under the hood so they learn from training data and by doing that learning they create ai rules ML, let's say ML inference, that's machine learning inference. Once the model has been trained, it cannot make inferences. These inferences is the same thing as predictions or new data that the model has never seen before. So see this kind of scenario, we have the ECG with unknown condition. Um, ECG, that's in the med medical field, right? Yeah, so ECG is a simple test that can be used to check your arts, rhyme, and electrical activities. Sensors are attached to your skin to detect electrical signals produced by your arts each time it beats. Okay, so that is what is called the ECG. It's used in medical practice. Okay, so, um, so here, yeah, let's say we have an ECG with unknown condition, unknown pattern, and you feed that into a trained model that already defined a prediction function, you know, like a prediction rule. 
that could give you a diagnosis, you know, based on what the model parameters are or what the model parameters uh, have been conceived during the learning phase. Now, once the model learns, then it comes up with a with some set of rules like model parameters that we take in any new data that you feed in, we process that new data using those model parameters learned during the training stage before this uh, prediction stage, you know, way, f um, way far behind before we arrive at this. Because at this point now, you know, this is like a prediction point. This model has been trained in the past, let's assume that. And it has model pa parameters, it has learned then, you know, by then in the training phase. And it even has some prediction function already set up. So when you feed in a new data, it can just apply what is as learned before about ECG and use it to classify this ECG and diagnose the disease. Okay, so that's how it works. That's what we mean by inference phase or prediction phase. This prediction phase, you must have trained your model before this phase. MA performance monitoring and retraining. So just like classic computers, where software developers do their regular software updates to fix boxes, uh, box, sorry, I said boxes, to fix box and increase performance and hard features. Machine learning models also need to be updated regularly by adding new data to the old training pipelines and running them again. Then there's a question, why? Now, I know that, um, I don't know how many times you've updated your WhatsApp this year, but I'm quite sure you've, you've updated it several times. Uh, you know, even WhatsApp themselves, they will ask you to go and update it, okay? Otherwise, some features will not be available for you. So those updates, you know, they are not just random updates. Is is either they are adding new features, and you need to update your WhatsApp in order to get those new features, just added by WhatsApp by their programmers, or they are using it to fix bugs. So bugs are, you know complications in the software. So they might have discovered some bugs or loopholes. It could, it could, it could also be some uh, vulnerabilities or loopholes in the software and they fix or block those loopholes, you know, because, you know, hackers can take advantage of loopholes in softwares and hack the software. So, once they have fixed those loopholes, they will keep asking you to go back and, uh, and update your software so that you can be protected. So uh, in machine learning also, we don't train them and leave them because data is changing. Economic realities are changing and you need to always go back and update your machine learning model, you know, retraining them on current data sets or new data sets, updating their training parameters and the likes. Now let's see the why and how I answered that. So over the time, machine learning models get still. Their reward performance generally degrades over time if they are not updated regularly with new training data that matches the changing states of the world. The models need to be monitored and retrained 
regularly for data or concept drifts. So we have what is called data drifts. So we have what is called data or concept drifts. Uh, well, I'll come back to that. Harmful predictions, performance drops. So the performance of that model may drop, you know, may drop over time. And that's why you need to retrain it again. To stay up to date, the models need to relearn the patterns by looking at the most recent data that better reflects reality. So the world is not static. Economic situations in the world is not static. Okay, <clears throat> your country is not static. Within two years, a lot of things would have changed, but within four years, even you yourself, you are not static. You are, you are changing. Your worldview is changing. Your perspective is changing. Your belief is changing. Your goals are changing. So when we set up a machine learning, we also need to go back and update or retrain it from time to time. If you don't do that, it will lead to what is called a data or concept drift. That means your machine learning has drifted from the realities in the present uh, world or economic condition. Imagine a model trained on economic data of Kenya. Many things might have changed in the first quarter of this year in Kenya. So your model may drift from that realities or from those realities. And once it drifts, uh, of course, anything you do with that model will become erroneous by then. So let's go ahead. I think they said uh, do duplicates. Okay, I can just delete this. Okay, so then we also have model veri verifiability and explainability. So understanding how AI works is essential to fostering trust and confidence in the system. So for example, some machine learning algorithms, the way they generate their predictions, you can easily understand them. By tomorrow, I'm going to do demonstration or simulations of different machine learning algorithms that we have. And you are going to see that some of them are really simple to understand how they work. Whereas some of them, especially those that belongs to the neural networks or deep learning, because of their complex uh, architecture, they are very difficult to understand how they work. Of course, they are mathematical concepts, but because of the layers, the architecture, the mathematics is also very deep. And a business or an, an organization may not easily understand them, how they work, even though they may good give, even though they may good, um, even though they may give good results, you know, but their explainability is quite low. Okay, so we take ex explainability serious in machine learning, okay? We want models that are simple to understand. Stakeholders, the business, everybody can easily understand how they come about their predictions, how they generate their predictions, you know, like that. And that could also help in troubleshooting them, you know, or retraining them. Now, we, we have come to what can machine learning do? Okay, so machine learning, of course, can do a lot of things or can be applied to a lot of uh, things around us. 
also can recognize and understand text and natural language like the GMA autocompletes. So whenever you are composing your GMA, you will see that GMA will be trying to predict what you will write next. So that's a kind of machine learning, trying to understand natural language. Then we also have the chatbots. I believe some of you, you've chatted with a chatbot uh, before. So chatbot also, they are intelligent systems that try to mimic human to human communication. Of course, they must have been trained to understand natural language. Then we also have text summarization and extraction. Machine learning can also write human-like answers to questions and assist in writing computer code, like the new GitHub Copilots. Then they can also recognize and understand images and video streams. So an AI can see and understand what it sees, image recognition. It can identify and detect an object or a future in an image or video. It can even identify faces, that is facial recognition. So all these are what machine learning can do. It can scan news broadcast, it can read and access text that appears in videos. It can be used for threat detection, you know? So machine learning can do all this. Well, the difference between neural networks and deep learning, deep learning is uh, neural networks is the uh, architecture of deep learning. So uh, it's not as if it's a separate thing, yeah. So, uh, so these are what machine learning can do. Let's see more. Um, they can detect changes in patterns and recognize anomalies. You can see the picture by the right hand side here. This a time series. Uh, or uh, a time series data of temperature coming from sensor data. And you can see during the period where the series is deep, you can see the red dots, which stands for anomaly. You know, it has dropped, the, the, the temperature dropped too low. So that is anomaly. So, and those places, they are marked with uh, this um, yeah, purple is, no, they are marked with this orange uh, color. So um, these are anomalies, anomalies. So an anomaly detection is very important in many technology in order to monitor the health or the performance of that technology. So an AI can recognize those patterns, okay? This application can discover evidence of an attack on financial networks. It can be used to detect fraud in insurance filings or credit card purchases. It can identify fake news or fake reviews. It can even tag sensor data in industrial facilities in order to ensure safety. So all this falls under uh, anomaly detection, you know, anomaly detection. Some gadgets, they have this anomaly detection in them. You know, whenever the gadget is, uh, is being overloaded, you know, it tells you that uh, something is about to, uh, or, or uh, it tells you there is an anomaly you know, or sometimes some of them even stop, uh, stop, stop, stop working. Even in cars, 
you know we have them also in modern cars so all these are anomaly detection systems and they are all part of machine learning so machine learning can be trained on a data set to identify those periods of anomalies and inform uh, the software or the tool or the vehicle what to do in those uh, uh, periods it can stop working it can raise an alarm it can notify the owner it can you know it can uh, it can notify in case of fraud it can it can give a notice to the bank um, you know like that or in case of an industrial setting or product uh, pro, uh, an industrial setting where goods are being produced it can flag some products that are having anomalies and the producers or the uh, factory workers they can easily respond to that and isolate those products from the line so machine learning can also be used to power recommendation engines and ai can provide recommendations based on behaviors you exhibited in e-commerce this will be used to provide accurate suggestions of products to you in the future based on your shopping behavior or shopping pattern or shopping history example of those um, platforms that are really leveraging our recommendation engines are netflix tiktok instagram amazon we also have some few ones on conga and jumia in nigeria okay so these are recommendation engines we have it on youtube also and many not only social media channels or even e-commerce recommendation engines exists in most technologies now even on webs um, on website that has nothing to do with uh, sh social media so the main thing behind this is just to track you to to track you around online and to to identify what you love to watch whenever you come online and engage you with such contents so whatever you are seeing on the internet now when you go on internet uh, gone are the days whereby what you see on internet you don't know how it come about but this time around whatever you are seeing on your youtube whatever you are seeing on your instagram feed whatever you see whenever you log on to an e-commerce website and you want to buy something whenever whatever you see on some website that you do visit um there are actually things tailored to what you like or your online behavior so like this person say i want to buy a laptop with one terabyte hdd and immediately three recommendations were given to him based on what he wants to buy okay so in this way uh recommendation engine optimizes customer experience you know um allow customer to have different options uh, that matches with their intended uh, uh, activity um, online or their intents so what machine learning can do let's continue here ai in medicine so ai application are already appearing in radiology dermatology oncology um, we have some technologies here that have been developed that uses AI in medicine. So we also have AI medical image identification, which is an area where machine learning is uh, really used in, in medicine, especially to recognize images, scans and the likes, and tumors to perform operations and the likes. Then we also use them as decision supports, like virtual assistants. A kind of virtual assistant could be a chatbot. 
So virtual assistants can listen to and observe behaviors. They can build and maintain data models. They can predict and recommend uh, actions to assist people. Okay. Then we can also use them in supply chain. Machine learning can also be used in supply chain. AI applications are already used in predictive maintenance to predict when a machine will be at its optimal level or will break down so that you can quickly make pro provision or when a, a, a machine needs to be serviced. So, um, uh, so machine learning algorithm can easily predict where you need to service your machine to avoid the uh, breakdown. It can be used in risk management or disaster management. Okay, other fulfillment that is in that's in e-commerce, then supply chain planning for logistics company companies, then promotion management for marketing. So, uh, machine learning can be used for all this. Okay, it can be used in defense defense systems, which we will see later. Okay, so. Let's continue. It can be used in marketing, as I said. AI applications are already appearing in real time personalization of content and media for you um, on website or, or whenever you go on social media, you get a personalized content and media based on what you love to watch. Um, then it can reduce human costs and it can it can automate marketing and processes and tax constrained by human cost and capability it can uncover new customer insights and accelerate deployment at scale ai application already appearing also in customer assistance such as speech speech recognition, um, sentiment analysis to understand the sentiment of people around your products. Uh, it can be used in argumented quality assurance. It can be used to provide customer service 24-7 and cross-channel um, communications for your customers. Like on our website at Data Lab, I think, yeah, we, we have uh, a chatbot there that stays there 24-7 and chats with our customer, our website visitors, and engages them and discuss with them and take their emails for us, take their phone numbers for us. And when we just wake up, we just um, see all those, their conversations. And of course, it's very intelligent. That's a virtual assistant. So even though it has a name, but it's not a person, a real person behind it. So it's actually a chatbot, you know. It's a trained AI chatbot to respond to customers, to take their orders and like that. Yeah, so that when you are sleeping, somebody is handling your business for you. It's very important. So, um, because you can't say it is night, there's nothing like that. So, uh, that means uh, you, you are not really serious about this feed yet. Uh, be, because when you, when you are sleeping, other people are not sleeping. So, uh, if you sleep tonight, don't 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 assume everybody is sleeping. No. So some people can wake up by two o'clock, and that's where when they 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 want to go and buy 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 some things, or that's when they want to order for something online. Well, you are sleeping now. Okay. So not everybody sleeps when you are sleeping. So, uh, 
like me, I've ordered for things around 2 a.m. in the night before. I've ordered for things around 3 a.m. in the night. I've ordered for things around 1 a.m. in the night. And I know the owner of the store will be sleeping. But thank God, there are virtual assistants that can respond to me. So your business should be up 24 seven, it mustn't close. And you don't have to be, I'm not talking about physical store, but you deploying AI chatbots or virtual assistants to undo your business for you while you are sleeping. And respond to customers who may want to make some orders in the middle of the night or call for emergency. So AI can be used on the battlefield, okay? AI will enable new levels of performance and autonomy for weapon systems, autonomously collaborating as autonomous, autonomous, autonomously collaborating assets. Drones, we have the drone swarms, we have the ground vehicles that coordinate attacks, ISL missions, and more. We have uh, fusing and making sense of sensor data to detect threats, classify aircraft based on radar, searching for anomalies in radio frequency. Machine learning is better and faster than humans in finding targets hidden in high clutter background. So there's something called cluttered. So like the war in Ukraine now, if you have been following the war, you will notice that they are deploying advanced weapon systems in that war, especially drones. You know, they don't really need to go to the target. They can just send their drone and they monitor the drone. There are some drones that are called suicide drones. So they will go and collide and you know, also blow up uh, themselves in that. I think uh, Turkey has one very advanced one that they gave the Ukrainians soldiers uh, called Barakta. So Barakta drone. So this has very highly sophisticated drone uh, drone systems used for uh, uh, attacks, you, you know. So, and uh, some of them are suicide drones, just like I said, once they send them, they don't return back. They will go and eat the target and also explode. They carry bombs. So those drones carry bombs. Okay, so, uh, if you have been following the war, both the Russian side and the Ukrainian side, you can see all manners of advanced weapon systems that they are using. That will give you an idea of the use of AI and ML on battlefield. And those weapon systems, I don't think they even exist in Nigeria. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So... You could imagine if they bring all those to Nigeria. Okay, so we are not investing in all those uh, weapon systems, you know. Yeah. So, uh, but these uh, advanced countries, they have the money, they have the research, they have the technology, and they are investing and developing all these things. But in, in Africa, we are just um, at the mercy of God. We don't have all these things. Okay, so uh, that is it. Or we don't even have resources to, to buy them. Because to buy them also, they are very expensive.
Okay, unless uh, uh, you get a donation from the rich countries. So what can machine learning do? It can also be used also in woman to machine Timmy in exploring and analytics. Now, what makes AI possible now? There are four things that makes machine learning possible in, in the present world. Massive data sets makes it possible. You know, data set is constantly growing because of all these new technologies. Then improved machine learning algorithms too. So machine learning algorithms are being improved upon from time to time. Research is still ongoing in improving them, further improving their accuracy in making predictions, you know. So then open source code, pre-trained models and frameworks, they are also contributing to making machine learning possible now. The more computing power, like never before in the history of the world, is also contributing to the growth of or the use of machine learning. When I say computing power, you know, even your laptop that you are using now, the modern, if you have a modern la laptop, it's not like the laptop they were producing in 1995 or even in year 2000. A lot of things has changed. A lot of things, you know, have changed in in the use, in the production of laptops, in the kind of chips in the laptop. Uh, some laptops now they have very sophisticated chips in them, you know, and more computing power uh, because of that. Then, apart from personal laptops, we also have cloud services. You know, so this machine learning can be run in the cloud. Um, cloud could be like AWS, that is Amazon AWS, Google, Azure, uh, uh, okay, um, Microsoft Azure, and Google GCP. These are multinational companies that have built cloud data, cloud platforms that can run machine learning on massive amounts of data, you know. So, and they of of course they have more computing power than your own personal computer. So, more computing power makes machine learning much more possible, much more interesting, much more able to handle big, massive amount of data sets in billions, and of course improved machine learning algorithms too that can be trained or some pre-trained models you know i told you about pre-trained models models that have been trained on massive amounts of data that you can just adopt for your own projects now even though ai can do a lot of things which we've gone through some of them but what can't AI do? What can't AI do? So why AI can do a lot of things better than humans when focused on a narrow objective? There are many things it still can't do. AI works where in specific domain where you have lots of data, time and resources to train domain expertise to set the right goals and rewards during the training but that is not always the case for example ai models are only as good as the fidelity and quality of the training data you know i told you about the training data so ai on their own they may not be able to control some things like the training data you feed into them. So having bad labels can wreck 
havoc on your training results. Protecting the integrity of the training data is critical. Protecting the integrity or the quality of your training data is critical because this is what they learn from. And once those training data are no way uh, processed, when you didn't take time, you know, to go through the data processing class that we did, you will see that anything you do and you call results at the end of the day will just be a mess. You have only wasted your time. So you will want to try as much as possible to maintain good quality data, both your training data and test data, or generally your data, okay? Clean it, correct for outliers, uh, fix missing values, standardize the data, uh, cap outliers, uh, check this, check that, you know, just try as much as possible to fix the the data you may not okay you may say okay how will i know the data is properly cleaned well you can use your intuition once you have done all those things you can use your intuition and just assume yeah i have the i have a clean data now I, I, at least i've done a lot of things yeah so so that that is it and you can also do some write some codes to check for some things you know and just be sure you've tried your best in cleaning the data and you have a quality data that you can use for training your machine learning algorithms, okay? Now that brings us to overfitting. So AI is easily fooled by out of the domain data, things it hasn't seen before, so it can be fooled by it. This can happen by overfitting okay so precisely overfitting is when a model trains for too long on a sample data or when the model is too complex it can start to learn the noise and irrelevant information within the data sets so this overfitting is when your model memorizes noise and irrelevant things in the data during training instead of learning the real thing in the data, learning the real patterns in the data, getting to understand the real or relevant characteristics in the data. Instead of doing all those things, your model can be picking up noise and irrelevant things in the data and could result to what we call, what we call uh, overfitting uh, what is called overfitting, you know, in, in data science, that's a popular term in, in data science that you need to know. So overfitting. So when it overfits, it will not be able to generalize to new data sets. So this overfitting, just see it as your model memorizing the whole data that becomes useless for new predictions or new data. You know, the purpose of training in machine learning is actually to make predictions on new data and give us new outputs. Okay, but once you train your model and at the training phase, it memorizes the training data too well and it becomes useless for any other thing. You know, when you get used to something, you may not find it easy to adapt to new circumstances you know if you train a model for example to predict if a person is diabetic or not but let's say during the training of that model that model trains for too long it's complex no it's not now now complexity complex complexity could also result into model overfitting because once a model is too complex, like deep learning, for example, those deep learning models, for example, because they are complex, when a model is too complex, it tends to learn a lot of things. And in doing that, it can pick up irrelevant things or just get used to the training data too well. And we don't want that. 
even though we want our model to learn well, but we don't want it to be too used to the training data because this process doesn't stop at the training stage. We are still going for the inference uh, stage, you know, where we are going to start using it for predictions. So it doesn't stop at the training phase. So why would the model get too used to the training phase? I will not be generalizable to our predictions, our new predictions later on. So that's what we call overfitting. And it's a very bad thing in data science, especially when you have a score of 0 0.99, 0 0.98, or 99%, 98% accuracy. That is a red flag that the model has already overfitted because it's going to give you a very good score. But when you get it out to the testing phase, it's not good. The performance of that model will not drop. That, sh that tells you that that model, even though it learned very well, having a score of 99% at the training phase, but when it gets to the main testing, <clears throat> you know, to test it with new data sets, the performance immediately drops. Okay, so that's a sign of overfitting. You could also have a problem of underfitting. Underfitting is when you pause your training too early or you excluded many important features or variables that that model should have learned from. That your model would tend to, to underfit, underfit, underfit is <clears throat> also a problem. So this is a pictorial illustration of those scenarios, including optimal fitting. So you can see in a regression project here, this is underfitting the data points here. This one is like an optimal fitting, a good fitting with a good score, both at the training stage and at the testing stage. And this one is overfitting. You can see it memorizes the old data. It memorizes it. So this kind of model, you can use it outside this stage. It ends its life cycle at the training stage, which is not the goal of any machine learning projects. It's not to overfit the training data, but rather to just learn the general pattern in the training data so that we'll be able to use it on new data sets. So these are just um, class uh, example of underfitting, overfitting for regression, classification, and then we have this for deep learning. If you are doing deep learning training, this internship doesn't do, we won't do anything that has to do with deep learning. But uh, deep learning is an area you can pick up on your own as you go ahead in this field in the near near future. So um, so that is what we mean by underfitting and overfitting. So underfitting is when your model do not learn well from the data. Then overfitting is when your model learn too well from the data that becomes useless for new things or new predictions. You know, it memorizes the training data too well and you can't use it on uh, your tests uh, uh, the data because once you try to use it on the test data, the performance will drop. So um, let's see this. So setting goals for AI. AI is poor at estimating uncertainty and confidence and explaining its decision making. So what we mean by this is really that I don't mean it's poor in prediction, as in it cannot choose its own goals. It cannot choose its own goals. It cannot set that dividing line between uncertainty and confidence. So it's only human beings that can do that. So executives now need to define the decision that the AI will execute. Uh, this is not a kind of going back to 
the traditional computer programming, but this in this sense means that we need to uh, at, articulate some goals for the model, which will lead me to also teach you about data science project blueprints or planning. So that when you are setting out on any data science project, you as the data scientist or as or even the manager in the company, you know, doesn't have to be, he or she doesn't have to be a data scientist. So, but you guys just need to sit down as a team and deliberate on what the AI will achieve, what the model goals will be, um, what the model's KPIs will be, key performance indicators, to show that it's a success or a failure, uh, you need to define the uncertainty and confidence in the AI based on its performance. But that's guideline. You are the one to draw that for the AI. Okay, because when you use this AI, um, Except for simple cases, and AI can't yet figure out cause and effect or why something happened. It can give you the prediction, but cannot tell you why it happened. Okay? So it cannot think creatively or apply common sense. So it's human being that has this common sense. Okay, and we can say, okay, this is a prediction from the model okay we know why this happened but the AI doesn't know these are computers you know computer algorithms so they will do the work they will predict for you you can check their predictions how they arrived at their predictions but by themselves they cannot they cannot explain what really took place they cannot explain why they arrived as such a prediction, like an AI that was trained to predict if a person is diabetic or not. Such an AI can do its own work, its own calculations, its own learning from the data and tell you this patient is diabetic. Yeah, so what it tells you is that diabetes, you may want to vet the decision of that AI by bringing in your own human judgments, okay, and trying to know why this person, why the AI predicted that this person may be the, 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 the diabetics, that could lead you to check the box, um, go behind the scene, how that prediction was made, um, see if you can agree with the AI or not. And if you can, uh, if you are fine with how the AI is going with its own prediction, or you want to question it, or you want to refuse to believe the AI or the model, or you want to do more checks, or you want to, so, especially in sensitive situations like you're applying it for medical diagnostics you may need to bring in the doctors to also uh, check the results in and out check the predictions and try to use their own common sense and see if the ai can be trusted with such uh, the diagnostics or they can you know do do something else so but most times ai can be trusted of course yeah but you may just want to set some goals and use your own human judgment to to still check uh, their 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 predictions so this is a uh, machine learning life cycle what you will go through by the time you are working on your projects you will first define your model goals, then you will, so AI will not do, do this for you. You are the one who, who will define your model goals by yourself. So 
loading the data and the libraries, the data sets. Then you, we do exploratory data analysis, like descriptive statistics, data visualizations, just to explore the data. Then you are going to do data preparation. You are going to clean your data. You are going to choose your future. You are going to do data transformation, you know, different data transformation, like scaling, uh, fixing outliers, fixing missing values, and all those things. Then after that, um, you are going to um, train your model, model to nearness, okay? Evaluate models, yeah. So after that, you go to evaluate models where you do train test splits. Then you, you identify your evaluation metrics in line with your model goals, which you set at the, before you set out on the projects at this first stage. You make sure your evaluation metrics aligns with your model goals or your business goals or the goal for these projects. Then you do model comparison. That is if you are training multiple models on that data. Then from there, you can decide to enhance the model using some techniques like research then finally, you can get your final model, and you can now test that final model on your test data. And, uh, use the variable or model intuition to see if the performance on test data has really performed well and you love it. Then you can now save and, of course, deploy the model for use maybe in an in in a software in an in an application you know yeah like that so this is a life cycle and you can see it involves several steps uh, this life cycle you will do it all by yourself in this internship but if you happen to work in a company of course, you will not be the only data scientist there, probably. So it will be a team of data scientists. They will be the one working their way through all this life cycle to get a data science project done. So machine learning life cycle. So this, you can go through it. This is very, very important, very, very important steps okay then uh thank you yeah so i think that is all so i hope you you enjoy this and uh, you love it and you've learned a lot of things so let me have your question, any question? Any question from anyone? So by tomorrow, I will uh, concentrate now on the different machine learning algorithms you can train. And I'm going to show you how they work behind the hood by using some simulations. And that will drive the understanding home of how they work so that when you are using them and writing your code on Jupyter Notebook, you have an idea of what is going on uh, behind the scene when those models or those machine learning algorithms are uh, training. Yeah, so I'm done. Um, so any question from anyone?
Any question? So you see the reason why we define a, a goal or a problem and we train the model to solve that problem. So that's what a data scientist do. And these are the steps to get that done. Okay, so uh, if there's no question, I think uh, we can meet tomorrow to look at those simulations of machine learning algorithms, different types. We have many machine learning algorithms we use in data science for training. I cannot exhaust all of them because there are so many, but I'm only, I will only treat the popular ones that you can also use in your final projects. Okay, so thank you so much and uh, we'll catch up again by tomorrow. Um, bye from here, bye-bye.